let's go into analyzing deals and properties and doing value research. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is, again, you want to do, you want to take a step back when doing the research. Whether you do blind offers or texting or cold calling or neutral letters, the point is when you make the actual offer, you don't have to be the world's biggest expert on that property. Because number one, our contract that we'll talk about in a second allows you to back out any time for any reason of the contract. Our contract allows you, to, allows, allows you to cancel this thing. Like, you can cancel the contract. So we'll never get stuck with a bad deal. And number two is also the detailed research you only need when you have the deal on a contract. I mentioned earlier that I just had to renegotiate with one of the sellers because it turned out that, uh, that in, in essence there was, um, what was the situation? It turns out that the property was an acre, but then after the title company went through the process, they realized that a, lot, that a big piece of it had already been taken off by a road and an easement and it wasn't buildable, and all of a sudden the usable space was much, much smaller than the actual deal was that. Could I have found that out ahead of time? No, That's a, that came out of the title search. So what the point is, we made an offer assuming everything is good, and then something came up, and then we just called the seller back and renegotiated. It's as easy as that. Most of these sellers, again, one thing I haven't mentioned is on the seller side of things, we are not looking for motivated sellers. We are not. Instead, what we're looking for is what we call non-wanters. Because there's a difference. A motivated seller is going to give you the property for 60, 70 cents on the dollar. A non-wanter is going to give it to you for 10 or 20 or 30 cents on the dollar. A non-wanter is somebody who is an heir that says like, screw it, I don't want this thing. A non-wanter is the guy that went to a divorce and says like, I want, don't want to leave this thing behind. I, I, I have no, no desire for it. A non-wanter is the lady, what's her name, that uh, gave us the Mojave County property? Do uh, you remember her name just recently? Um, anyway, so she basically said like, you know, I was a stunt woman in Hollywood for, for, for a bunch of years. I bought this property when I was 18 years old. I'm in my 70s now. I haven't seen this property for 45 years, and I don't care about it. Right? You can have it. Is that? That's the kind of when I mean, you can have it for a reasonable amount. In this case, I think like $2,600. But um, but is that a reasonable? Is that a? That's a non-wanter. Right? That's a non-wanter, and there's a lot of them out there because people buy these properties. As a matter of fact, as we have now determined. They actually, even the people that were excited about the property 20 years from now that bought it from us are now reselling it to you guys, right? They're becoming non-wanters over time. And so that's a key thing. So therefore, you don't have to be afraid of a renegotiation with a, with a seller. They're willing to do that. Now, not every seller is a non-wanter. Sometimes in hot areas, you can get some deals from motivated sellers at 60 cents on the dollar, as, as Aaron said earlier, and then go sell them for close to full market value very quickly as a wholesale deal too, right? But bottom line is, uh, the detailed research, the key is only when you have the deal on the contract. Before that, there's actually no money on the line because our, one, because our contract ad, doesn't even have a provision for a earnest money deposit. Christian, how, many, how much earnest money deposit have you put down on your deals? 2,700, you actually have put some down? We've done 20, across 70 properties, we've done about 20. $700. Okay, means, so they're violating our rules here and they're actually 100, putting in. 100 per property. 100 per property. So you are putting an earnest money deposit. You don't actually have to do to that. Negotiate. 100 per property. It's nothing. Yeah, it's nothing, I know. But so they're, they're choosing to slightly violate our rules here and, uh, and still put down $100 as earnest money deposit. By the way, you can cut that to 20 and it's just going to be accepted just as well. So the point is, so, but uh, let me see. For those of who do deals, who is not using earnest money deposits? Raise your hand. Look at that. There's like at least 30, 40, 30 hands up here. No earnest money deposit. So therefore, there's no money on the line. Now, once you have a deal under contract, money in a way is on the line, uh, but not really because you still can back out of the deal anytime for any reason. But at least there's a little bit more commitment on your side. There's a little bit more. You now have a buyer perhaps lined up. So there's some money to be made more than anything. You can still back out of the deal. So by, by basically by, doing, by only doing the detailed research when you have a deal on a contract, it saves you a ton of time. And that's the key here, right? So when you do research, why again, ability to back out of a contract, there's also margin of safety. Because if you only offer 5, 10, 25, 35, 45, 55% of market value, 
then, uh, then there is, so there's a typo, I should be saying a little more, uh, then, then, then you don't have to, then what if you're wrong? What if you think the property's worth $50,000 and you offer, you offer 15 on it? Well, what if it's only worth 35? Can you still make like 10 grand on it? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you have that margin of, of, of safety. Compare that again to houses. In the housing world, if you say this house is worth has an after repair value of $500,000, and now you're saying, oh, well, it's gonna take $70,000 in repairs plus $30,000 in closing costs and financing costs, so if I get it under contract for $320,000, I can sell it to a rehabber for $340,000 and they'll still make some money. Sounds good. Well, what if you were wrong in the, estimate, in the repair estimate and it, instead of costing 70, it costs, uh, it costs 100? And what if you were wrong in the after repair value and instead of being able to sell it for 500, you can only sell it for 480 even? Your margin just evaporated. You got no more margin in the deal and so on. We, we don't deal in that world. Like in the house world, you have to be absolute, pretty accurate in order to get, to get, to make money on the deal. Here we don't have to be accurate. Whether that property is worth 80 or $100,000 does not make that much difference on the offer that you make, right? So that's important things. Also, uh, you put no, or in this case, well, I see I already predicted you guys do some earnest money deposit. So like one to $10 earnest money deposit down. I know some people do it. I also know that you're being pressured by title companies to put earnest money deposits down. A lot of title companies say like, well, this is not valid without an earnest money deposit. And it's like, Yes, it is, but sometimes when they insist that they don't want to do deals with you, if you don't put earnest money deposit down, it's easier to say, okay, I'll, I'll ask for 10 or 20 or 50 or $100 in earnest money deposit. But legally, you don't have to. Because in law, it says, and, and I'm not an attorney, but multiple attorneys have confirmed that to me, uh, that in order for a contract to be valid, it needs seven provisions. It needs to have, don't, I don't know if I'm gonna get them all right, but you need a, a seller and a buyer, or in this case, like a two parties, party one and party two, so two parties. You need a subject, so then object, I mean, so what is the contract about? In this case, a piece of land. Uh, you need um, a, the signatures of both people, so that's where we're at five now. And then I forgot one more, but the seventh is consideration. And what people misunderstand consideration to me is uh, to mean, is they misunderstand that to mean earnest money consideration. Earnest money is not consideration. What consideration is, consideration is the actual purchase price of the property. That's what you pay them for it. And that's in the country. So like I, uh, whatever it is, uh, Maria, I, Maria, sell to Jordan the property described as one, two, three Main Street, for $50,000, oh, it's a time of closing. There's some kind of timeliness. It can't be an open having a contract forever. So that's the seventh kind of pr provision. And then uh, the, con the, the per property, close of escrow to be March 30th, 2024, and uh, for the amount of $5,000, and there's your signatures. This is a legally binding contract because the consideration is $5,000. The amount of the, the earnest money is only something that is usually done. It's customary, but not legally necessary. Does that make sense, guys? So therefore, don't let them bully you into it. Just basically say like, no, it's not necessary. Well, they might say, well, then we don't want to do it. And then you can choose to either do it or go to a different title company. But by, by, by law, it's not necessary to do this. All right. So then, uh, and then, by the way, I, I want to just, just one more time quickly to the seller financing kind of thing. I, I just love it so much. Is that, uh, look at this guy. This is, uh, for example, this is a case study. Uh, one of our students, this is, Char uh, this is what's his name? Um, forgot his name here. Oh, it's actually not on the screen. Anyway, he bought a property for $2,900, sold it for $33,000 with $4,000 down, and a loan for, and he got another, so $4,000 loan, and you can see that. How much did he pay for the property? $2,900. How much did he get it sold? What's, what's his down payment? $4,000, exactly what we keep saying. With a monthly payment, with a loan for $29,000 at 13.5% interest for over five years, for five years, again, interest rates, high interest rates, at $667 a month. 
And this is the actual email they received to Chuck, one of our prior team members, is like last week, I sold and financed my fourth lot on land in owner finance, and now I have over $2,000 in monthly pan and passive income from owner financing. So Jack's system is working. Here are the stats on this, on this lot that was an acreage in Lakeland, which is in Florida. 2.08 acres, purchase price 2,900, back taxes 500, so I guess they can add them or subtract them, whichever way he structured the deal, it wasn't clear. And then sold for $33,000, and with owner financing, with a mortgage of $4,000 down, a balance of $29,000, 13.5% interest for five years, principal and interest $667 with no balloon. Anyone okay with those deals? Who would like to do deals like that? Give me a heck yes. yes. There we go. All right, so let's talk about property valuation. All right, property valuation. So there's, there's different kind of, pro different kind of uh, methods that are being used depending on what kind of property we're dealing with. So the first kind of properties, uh, the first kind of uh, thing, I always chuckle when people say like, Jack, how do you value land? And somebody asked that earlier, right? Who is that? Yes. Well, how do you value houses? Uh, Comps. Well, here's the thing. Up until about eight years, 10 years ago, probably 10 years ago, this answer, there wasn't an ability to chuckle because Le like Zillow, Trulia, Land.com, all these different places did not provide sale information on land up until about 10 years ago. But now they do. So the simple, today my answer is about how do you value uh, land? And so I say like, how do you value houses? I say the answer is always comps. My answer to that is, well, we do the exact same thing. Why not? You can use exactly the same kind of comps. You can go on Zillow. You pinpoint your property, and then you go or look around what other properties have sold there, and right there you got your comps. Now, if that doesn't work, there's a second way, and actually that's the way Michelle and I had to use for the first 12 years of doing land deals. And that, for that way, that, that way that when there was no sold comps whatsoever, there was nothing, nothing, nothing published, all we had was listed comps. So in other words, when we wanted to know what a property was worth, we went into websites like uh, realtor.com, uh, back then was the big, uh, the big real estate website, was realtor.com, wasn't Zillow. Uh, we went on realtor.com, and nowadays you go on Zillow, and you can still do the same thing. You go simply switch from sold to listed, and you see what properties are listed there. Uh, you can do that. The third way is uh, the percentage of house value method. That one you want to use in an infill lot situation. Because if you have an inf infill lot situation, by definition, there's not many different, uh, not, uh, not any different comp comps available. Just think about it. You have a street, there's 35 houses. It's fully built up, and there's one empty lot. And that might be the only empty lot in the entire neighborhood. How are you going to get a comp if no other lots are for sale or sold? Well, in that case, you do, is, you, you do what appraisers do and you allocate a piece of the, of the house values in the area to the land. Right? We'll cover those in a second. There's slides for each of them. And then the fourth one is the per acre method. And that typically you do that in a more rural, larger acre kind of environments. And then finally, the fifth one is you can also use the assessed value, but be careful with it because assessed values are often off uh, because they typically lag a couple of years behind real values and, and, and so on. Uh, okay, so let's talk about lots. Uh, for, for lots out in outskirts of large cities, like, you can do comps like houses. There's usually a lot of these, a lot of these lots available. There's usually a whole bunch of lots around, uh, around cities. And, um, and what happens is you simply look around. If you have a five-acre lot and there's 25 other five-acre lots and five of them have sold in the last year and they have sold for forty-five dollars to $50,000, what's yours worth? Forty-five to fifty thousand dollars. You look at the then you look at the sale date, and if you see that the ones that sold like six months ago sold for forty-five, and the ones that sold three weeks ago sold for fifty, then you know your value is forty-five is fifty thousand dollars. If it's the other way around, then you want to probably be a little bit more careful and pick the forty-five thousand dollar value as the market value, because prices seem to be going down a little bit. So then um, that's the thing. There's quite a few sales happen. You find like kite properties within a couple of miles. More important than the, than the distance is really the nature of the land. If it's, like, if it's like similar kind of area, similar kind of road access, similar kind of access to everything, that's a good comparable area. 
It doesn't have to be like three steps away. It can be a mile, two miles away. We submit our amenities close by and then compare the sales prices. And then you're done. You got your, you got your comps. Five minutes, less, sometimes, sometimes 30 seconds. If no salts are count, no salts comps are found, either because they're not disclosed, they're not, not, you know, nothing is sold, which is kind of an alarm signal. If nothing is sold, you can go back in time a little bit. So like, well, if nothing is sold in the last 90 days, well, let me go 180 days. Then you go, I'm comfortable going, going to, to the last year, because again, usually there's a little bit of less volume in the land space in sales than there is in the house space. So you're going back by a year is fine, but if it, within one year, you don't find anything that's remotely similar that's sold, you might want to ask yourself even in the right area, right? So that's one question. But, uh, but then, but let's say if, if there's, or the other option is like states like Texas are so-called non-disclosure law, non-disclosure states. And a non-disclosure state, it means that they simply don't need to disclose how much a property, when you buy a property, you don't need to disclose how much you bought it, uh, sorry. When you sold a property, you don't have to disclose how much you've sold that property for. So therefore, if you go on Zillow and you go into Texas and you look around and you show uh, on, on Zillow and sold, it's all a bunch of question marks. There's no, there, you don't see what property sold. In that case, you're back to 10 years ago when there's no sold. So you do what Michelle and I have done for the first 12 years of doing this. You switch over immediately on Zillow to, so, to listed properties. And you look at what they're listed for, because here's the realities. Do the realtors know what these properties are worth? Yes, they do. The brokerages, let me say that. Do the brokerages know what these properties are worth? The answer is yes, because just because it's not being published, do you think, what's, what's one of the largest brokerages? I'm, I'm, I'm Keller Williams, let's say. Uh, it's a Keller Williams in outside of Dallas, Texas. Does Keller Williams that represented, let's say, 500 land deals over the last year in that greater vicinity, in that greater area, do they know what these properties sold for? Yes, of course, because they represented every single sale. They have all the files in their books, they have all the files in their computer, in their, in their computer systems, in their software, in their CRMs, in their deal management system, whatever they use. They have all the paper files, or if it's all electronic, they have everything there. They know exactly what's sold. The thing is, they haven't disclosed it to the county. And that's why it's not on Zillow. It's not public record, but they know what it is. So guess what? Somebody walks into the office and like, I have a piece of land, I would like you to list it. They know exactly what to list these properties for because they know exactly what, their, what the last 100, 250, whatever it is, sold in the last year. So, they, so when they go list it, they're not going to go and say like, well, let me take this price and put it up there. They're going to simply go and see, well, what did the other one sold for? Oh, the other one sold for 50K. Okay, great. Let me go now out and list this for 60. Because as a realtor, you're always going to push the price. You're always going to try to get a little bit more than the last guy got for your last, for your, for your last listing. Is that right? No. Right. So, no? The goal is to get it sold, but at least you often start a little bit pushing. I mean, I want a realtor. It's not worth it to list a property if it's not going to sell. That's right. My but some people are taught that way, so I'd rather right. get my property sold than just to have it sit there for six months and then not make anything off of it. That's right. So she's making a good point. That is that, that it's more like a philosophical argument, I would think. Right? That is like, no, the best realtors get their property sold. They don't, they don't overprice them. Uh, and I do agree with that, that the goal of the realtor is to get the property sold. I also do appreciate our realtor that goes and says, like, hey, let's try for a few weeks pushing the price a little bit and see and if we can't get it, we can always drop it. So it's a more philosophical question about what is a good realtor and what is not. And we'll have probably much more of that philosophical question as we go into Sunday and talk about selling these properties when I'm really going to harp on realtors. Because most realtors actually, I, I, I actually have a real estate license in Arizona. I don't use it. It actually expired right now. I need to renew it before October. But uh, I, uh, I have never used it to represent anyone else but myself. I only used it when we, and not even for land deals, I re use it when we bought our home, which by the way is 7,100 square feet, not 5,700. Michelle, <laughs> she, she, my, she sounds, sounds almost like she feels it's too small already. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, the, the, um, and, and when we buy commercial property, we can represent ourselves. So, but other than that, there's no reason to have a license for this business, and there's no harm in having a license. So it doesn't hurt you, and it doesn't help you. 
right? Our deals continue to flow exactly like they did before I had a license and after I had a license. Does not change a thing. So the point is though, anyway, to get back to the point here is that when you, um, on Sunday I talk about realtors are not trained to sell land. They're trained to sell houses and most of them don't have a clue how to present the land properly. And we'll talk about that on Sunday. But let's go back to the, oh, my battery's running low. Uh, something happened here. Alex, can you help me? All right, it's, I found it. I found it. I don't, I don't need help. I just don't need to make sure my thing is not dying. I got it. I got it. Uh, I was more like finding it somewhere in there, because I, but I found it. So um, again, so if no solds are comparable, found, then, then you go simply, you go to listed comps. But here's the thing. It is, it is proven and it's shown. You can actually compare that and that the listed properties in the land space, or that in the land space, land typically sells for about 15% less than its asking price. For a, at, at full time, I'm not talking to people like us that sell it at bargains, I'm not talking about the people like us that sell it for seller financing. I'm talking the regular realtor that puts the $50,000 property up for, for, for $60,000 and then gets an offer for 50 and sells it. That's what I'm talking about, right? So, this, so what you simply do in that case the properties are listed for $60,000. You have no comps, no sold comps. You say, okay, well, if there's five properties, they're all listed for 60. Let me subtract 50, 15%, which is about $9,000, takes me to $51,000. And that's right where you probably want to be. And therefore, you have your comp at this point. It's really quick. So if no sold's available, go to listed comps, and then you're done. Uh, most large acreage. Most large acreage is not in the city. Most large acreage is actually in more rural areas. Because what I'm about to explain is true only in the outside of the city, and the exact opposite is true in the side of the city. So what I mean by that is basically, in this particular case, what happens is, uh, let's say there's nothing of similar size available. Let's say you have a 20-acre parcel that you want to make an offer on, and all you see in the neighborhood, uh, out there in the rural area, is a recreational area, is a 40, an 80, and a 10. No 20 acre parcel. So how do you now get to the value? Well, you can break it down by the acre. But in rural areas, and that's the key thing I wanna say, in rural areas, the larger the acreage, the lower the price per acre. That's something to keep in mind. It's almost like you get a volume discount. So if you, if you wanna buy 80 acres, 80 acres are not worth twice 40 acres. And 40 acres are not worth twice the 20 acres. So in other words, if you turn it around, the smaller the acreage, the higher the price there per acre. And that's important to notice, so you just make some adjustments. So you see a 10 acre parcel that's selling for, that sold for $20,000, and you see an 80 acre parcel that sold for $50,000. Well, shouldn't it 20, 40, 80, shouldn't be the 80 selling for $80,000? No, because the higher the value, the higher the size, the lower the price per acre. So you see, you go, so, so therefore, what, what does it mean for your 20 acre, par, for, your, for your whatever? You get my point. If you have a 30 acre parcel, it's somewhere in between. So you basically do, it's almost like a sliding scale. The larger the property, the lower price per acre. So, and that, that'll help you figure this, figure this out. At the same time, in the city though, by the way, if you get a hold of a larger piece of acre of, of land in the city, which usually comes at a high price point, it's the exact opposite. Because the higher, like in the city, if you have a quarter acre, what can you do with it? There's not that much you can do with it. You can put a house on there, you can perhaps a duplex, a fourplex on there, if, if, assuming the zoning, the city allows you to do it. But what if you have two acres in the city? Now you can potentially rezone it, you can potentially put 100 apartment units on it, and it becomes exponentially more valuable. So in the city, the larger the parcel you have, the more per acre it is, it is worth, because you can do more with it. In the, in the rural area, it's more like the opposite. Like at some point of time, all the city slickers that want a 20 acre mini ranch, they were like, great, 20 acres, yeah, I'll take 40, but I really don't need more than 40. Well, you want, you offer me 80? The 80 to me is not worth much more than the 40, because 40 is already a lot, right? So, as a result, does that make sense, guys? So it's, uh, uh, yes? Can you speak at all to things like uh, electricity to the property, water lines, any of that sort of stuff which might skew the pricing? 
Yes, of course. I mean, if you see, if you see, and that's why I'm talking about like kind property. You want to make sure that you take a look at, at, the, at, at what these properties do have, do come with. So particularly at Star, it, it doesn't matter in the city or not the city. Sometimes you see, and then you see subdivisions where there's a big discrepancy in assessed value between two sets of properties. So that's why we do always look at the assessed value. If only just, not necessarily for valuation, but we look at the assessed value just to see if there's something we should be looking at closer. Because for example, let's say there's a road, there's, there's two roads. The, the, the lower road, lots, and let's say it's, a, it's somewhat in the outskirts of town, it's a subdivision with like, 20 lots and five houses and 15 empty, 15 empty lots and five houses. And it's on both, 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 and both roads, it's kind of the same. Each of them have 20, so 20 parcels. Each of the roads have, but on one of them there is, there's 15 houses and one of them there's only two houses. And on one of them, the lot, are, on the top one, the lots are assessed for $40,000. On the bottom one, they're assessed for $10,000. Well, that gives you a pointer right there that you might want to pick up the phone and call the city and ask them, how about the utilities look like? How does the utility situation look like? Because chances are the top one has all utilities and the bottom one doesn't. And the city knows that, and some of that is built into the assessed values right away. That's why you always want to quickly look at the assessed value. And you see that, if you see that the bottom and the top one have the same assessed value, you can kind of assume that they have the same level of utilities. And then you make your offer based on that. And that just happens to be coincident that on the top road they built more houses than on the bottom one. Just perhaps because the people on the bottom one held on to it and didn't sell earlier. So. Uh, but, but sometimes that, that is a piece in there. But then the other part is um, utility roads in the rural areas. If you have 40 acres and you see that it's landlocked, immediately landlocked properties to me, 50% lower value, immediately. Like, and, uh, and, and that's a good ballpark number. And then you can go into, uh, and if you see one has a, has a nice road, and the other one has like a road that's like really deteriorated, then, well, at least we'll both have a road, then, because it's not that hard, you can get somebody, particularly in rural areas with dirt roads, you can get somebody with a backhoe to come and grade that road again for like 500 bucks, and you got a road again. Right, then, so the, that is not that much. But often even on aerial pictures, you see where the electric poles are. Poles are. The satellite picture, you see where those are and, um, and, and, and so on. So, so that plays a little bit of a role. And if you see that one, and, and, and sometimes you can also do like assumptions. So you see like one road and there's like a bunch of houses and the other road, there's, no, there's none and it's a rural area. Then you can kind of figure out that that road has electricity. Because if there's, after like the fifth person buys, builds a house there, some of them are going to say like, come on, let's, let's not do all rely on solar. Let's pay, let's pay to get the electricity pulled in here. And then, and that's like rural areas, right? So you can, you can play, you can just pay a little bit attention to what you see there, and then you'll find some things. Now the last one is infilot, or I don't know if the last one, one of the next one is infilot. The infilot is exactly the point of, the, you can't find lake, lake and land close by because it's 35 houses, one empty lot, there's no comps. So in that case, what do you do? You take about 20 to 25% of the house value and you apply that to the land. Because if you think about it, uh, it's actually something um, I always like to tease my house flipper friends with it. And I told my, I teased my house flipper friends by basically saying like, hey, you guys have never flipped a house. And they're like, what are you talking about? I flip 300 houses a year. It's like, no, you don't. Let me see the deeds. There's not a deed in the world in the United States that says that you flipped a three-bedroom, two-bath house. The deed always talks about lot 13 in block two in subdivision XYZ. We all, every house flipper has ever only flipped land. It just happens that there's a house on it <laughs> that increased the value of the land, right? So in essence, well, therefore, when you, when, 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 you, when you sell a house, you're really selling the land with the house, but the house has often more value than the land. So in a normal kind of four or $500,000 American, American normal neighborhood, the land is typically worth about 20 to 25% of, of what houses in the area sell for. So if you see that houses in the area sell for $500,000, the land is worth 100 to $110,000. Done. Is that regardless of uh, the price? Wonderful question. Uh, the question was, is that regardless of the price? No. That is also sliding scale. 
That is a sliding scale, and that means like, uh, ever heard of Randy Johnson, the baseball pitcher? Yep. All right, so Hall of Famer, things, uh, won the first championship for the Diamondbacks in Phoenix with, with them. And he lived in Paradise Valley, same place we live in. And he has like, there's on the other side of the street, and uh, like, in, in, like he had an, I think he had an estate of less like 15 acres. Now, Paradise Valley is, every house is on an acre, so it's, it's great. Now, he had a lot with 15 acres, and he sold that thing for something like $10 million. Like, that was like 15 years ago already, when he, when he moved away from Arizona. So he sold it for 15 million. In his case, I mean, I don't know what that house was made of, but probably not made of enough material to be worth $15 million. So in essence, in this case, the land was worth $10 million, and the house was worth $5 million. So if you go all the way up to the super luxury market, the land is worth more than the actual house. And if you go down to the below $300,000, $250,000, $300,000 price point, the land value becomes diminished. Because if you think about it, particularly in the infill, that's only true for the infill lot size. Because in this case, a, a, a builder for a house is always going to back into the value of the land. The builder is going to basically say, okay, great. So if I can, if I can sell, let's do the math. If, I can, if, I, if, if the smallest house I can put on there reasonably is 150, uh, 1,500 square foot, and let's say, even though prices have exploded, let's say I can still buy this house, or build this house for $100, square, $100 a square foot, which I think nowadays you have to probably spend more than that. Yeah, yeah, like more like two. Let's say 150. So 150 times 150 is what? 225, right? Is that right? Like, let's, 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 let's pick a number. Like, let's say it's cost them $250,000. Just putting the building onto the ground costs the builder $250,000. Let's just pick a number. $250,000, it's a reasonable amount for a very normal starter home these days because the price of construction has exploded like crazy. So now they, spend, they, they know $250,000 just to put the thing in there. Now the builder's gonna take a loan from the bank. The bank loan's gonna cost them an extra $10,000, $15,000. So now he's at $265,000. Now on top of it, he's gonna sell it to the realtor. The realtor is gonna make another commission, so then he has some extra miscellaneous costs and stuff like that. So let's say if everything is said and done, the realtor is in that deal, the, deal, the, the property is in, the, is in that deal for $330,000. And then he says, you know what, I wanna make a 20% profit on this thing, so I wanna make like $70,000. So, the real, so in other words, the builder, not realtor, the builder needs to now sell to be able to sell this property for $400,000, but he hasn't even considered the land yet. Just between the house building, the actual construction cost, the actual financing cost, the realtor cost, and his profit, he has to do at least $400,000. Now, if on top of it now, if the neighborhood sells for $500,000, he has an extra $100,000 to pay for the land. So he can pay $100,000 for the land and then have all these other expenses and then still make $70,000 on the deal when he sells it. And the builder will mostly, that's like, that's minimum by the way. At that minimum, the builder will then say, yeah, okay, it's a tight deal, but I'll do it. Now what if this is a neighborhood where houses sell for $300,000? The house still costs $250,000 to build. The realtor still needs to make money. The finances cost is still there. There's still miscellaneous cost. So now just putting the house on the, on the path cost him $330,000 and he can sell it for $300,000. There's no money left for the land and no profit for him. So the builders say like, thank you very much, I'm not interested. So the moment you go under about $300,000, even the tightest and most entry level home builder can no longer make the numbers work and is no longer interested in that place. Now they might still be interested at 10 grand or 15 grand or 20 grand just to buy it. And then if they have the hope or expectation that the prices in the area go up, they might still buy it. Also people in the neighborhood might still buy it to put their cars on there, to put their, uh, to put their boats on there, to, put, uh, to just basically expand their backyard. Or if, again, if they think the prices in the neighborhood will accelerate, they'll buy it just to have a lot in the neighborhood. So this, this, this doesn't mean that the lot is worth less. It just means it's worth less, right? Just means it's diminished in a way, and now it has a nominal value of about ten to twenty thousand dollars. 
So have we flipped lots in neighborhoods that are mostly, mostly $200,000 house neighborhoods? Yeah. Have we been able to sell these properties without problems? Absolutely. You just now sell them more to the neighborhood, to the people there that basically say like, uh, say like, yeah, I want to just hold it for, for long term and, and see if the neighborhood goes up. Now, everything, by the way, that I said is not true. The moment the neighborhood allows mobile homes. The, the, the moment the neighborhood allows mobile homes, these lots go immediately up in value because if you can, if you can have a mobile home or RVs, right, for that matter, the moment you have a, a, a property where somebody can just put like $10,000 worth of improvements and a concrete path and put a mobile home on there, you now have the retirement guy's dream ready to purchase. Because there's 70% of all Americans over the age of 50 are one financial emergency away from being broke. They don't have enough money to pay for if they're, to buy a new car if their car completely breaks down or gets totaled. They don't have enough money to pay a big medical bill and so on. So there's a lot of Americans that are in their 50s right now that are looking at and they're, they're say, basically saying like, well, how much is my Social Security going to be? What's the average American Social Security? What do you guys think? 1,500. I think 1,573 is the number I last read. So under $1,600 Social Security is the average American Social Security amount that most people will get. Well, that's the average, right? And uh, so that means that what is the average rent in a big American city? 1500 So there's a lot of people who eventually are going to be in a situation that they can pay for rent and not for food anymore. So the smart ones have decided to learn a new skill, learn a financial skill and so on, and that's fantastic. And, uh, and the second smartest ones, still very smart, basically say, well, if I can't afford to retire in the city, then how about I look outside of the city where I can find perhaps a spot in a smaller community or just half an hour outside of town that I can buy a lot that allows mobile homes, perhaps pay that thing, perhaps find somebody that's willing to give me seller financing for that. I couldn't imagine who would do that, right? So you can find somebody to pay me that allows me to pay it off in monthly payments, and then 10 years from now when it's paid off, they get a mobile home, put it on there, and now perhaps if they finance the mobile home, they have a $300 a month payment, but a free and clear lot, and they have a dignified retirement. We sell a lot of lots to exactly those kind of buyers because it's actually a service to community because their choices are either be in the food line like, uh, or be homeless or in the, in the food line at the food, uh, what do you call the things? The, the food bank, yeah, soup kitchen, food bank, uh, or move out of town, move into a low cost area, but still where there's a little town around and things like that. And so we're selling a lot of properties like that and they're high, high in demand. So the moment you can put a mobile home on the lot, those, pro those lots fly off the shelves very, very quickly. Yes, in the back. Microphone coming. When you do the seller finance, do you ever allow people to utilize the land? Before yes, so when, when we do seller financing, do we allow people to utilize the land? Yes, we do. Uh, we do put provision into our contracts that allow, that way it says they cannot uh, do anything to the land that lowers the value. Like, for example, here on the west side of town, uh, left side of the country, we do not allow them to cut down trees. Because trees are like more valuable than gold out here. Right, because we have none. Have you looked outside? Like, whichever way your, your window goes in the hotel, like if you look out there, it's desert. There's no trees, so if you have some trees on the property, keep them. Now, if you're in Georgia, there's more trees than people, right? That's not a problem. So, so, uh, but, but basically, do have them do not, not allow, don't allow them to do things that 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 kind of negatively affect the value of the property. But yeah, of course, we allow them to use it, and um, and so on. And usually, at this point, people also ask the question: Well, what if they build on it? Well, typically, most people don't have the money to build without a loan. And when they, have, when they do get a loan from the bank, a construction loan in that case, they do, uh, usually then you get cashed out and then it's no longer the problem because the bank is not going to subordinate their loan to your loan. So they're going to want to be the loan in the first position. So they're going to come to you and say like, hey, how much do they still owe you? You're like $27,000. Again, and then a few weeks later, you get a $27,000 check and, you, and you're, you're cashed out. So that's a good thing too. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, OK, so his question was, when you do settle financing, what's the typical term, meaning term in length of time, you like to finance it? It's up to you, whatever you want to do. Let me see, who, who likes short terms? Settle financing, look over there, a bunch of, who likes long terms? Right, that's 50-50 almost like, right? It depends on what you want to do. Michelle and I, what we developed for us is a sliding scale. So it's basically, it's, it's I believe that we have, I mean, it has, I believe it's proven for us that if you have a $100,000 loan and you want somebody to pay it off in three years, they have to pay you something like $4,000 a month. And that's not sustainable for most people. So if you, uh, or, or $5,000 or $6,000 a month or something like that. But if you have a $100,000 loan and you let them pay it off over 20 years, then it becomes a $1,200 a month payment. And most people can do that. Plus, if you have $1,200 a month over 20 years, that's a whole lot more interest you're collecting. Right? So that's one thing. The other thing is, at the same time, if you have a $3,000 loan like you do them, or $4,000 loan, it doesn't make sense to finance those for 20 years, because otherwise your monthly payment would be $29. <laughs> and that's not even worth the effort. So what we simply do is on the loans that are very low amount, we do it for three years. For the loans that are a little bit more for five years, then for eight years, for 10 years, for 12 years, for 15 years, for 18 years. And I think we've rarely done anything over 18 years. So the higher the, the balance that they need to pay off, the longer we allow them to pay, to, to, to pay it off, which means that it keeps usually, our, our loans are usually between $100 and about $900. And that keeps it really affordable for most people. But again, you're the CEO of your business. You do this whichever way you want to. And like, for example, this uh, John was his name, the gentleman before, he basically agreed on a $667 monthly payment for five years on a $29,000 loan. I think that's pretty aggressive, but hey, it's his business and he got away with it and that's no problem uh, and, and, and that's, that's fine, so it, that works. So again, but, but we try, we, we, did that kind of, we, we do this kind of sliding scale that we still follow to this day. We even have an analyzer that is in, our, in your guys' program, if you have one of our programs already, uh, that actually you put it in there and it, it uses our suggested time frames and things to, 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 to figure this out. All right, so where do we get to get values and comps? Well, obviously Zillow, Trulia, landwatch.com, the landguys.com are here. Right, because uh, they, they do now publish, they do now publish sold information. Zillow definitely, uh, Zillow and Trulia have lots and lots and lots of sold information. Um, so also, you can basically go, you simply go into find properties in the same subdivision. And then, or you can also go to the county's assessor website. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about the assessment, assessed value last. The assessed value is kind of like an iffy thing to use, but it, you can definitely use it for some, some things. The assessed value is something that that uh, counties don't just simply pick an assessed value out of thin air, even though sometimes it seems like it. Uh, they, what they do instead is they, they, or they use some kind of a formula. And I never figured out what these formulas are, but I basically figured out what the end result of it is. And because I don't have to become a math expert because of the, to the county, I just need to know what it means. And in many cases, what it ultimately means is that the assessed value is in a certain relationship to the market value. Like for example, in Arizona where we live, assessed value is typically two thirds of market value in a stable market. In Colorado, it's more like 85, 90% of market value. In Florida, it's more like 85, 90% of market value. In Arkansas, it's 20% of market value. That's important to know. Because if you looked at assessed values in Arkansas and it says it's $10,000, you think it's a piece of crap property, but it really means it's worth $50,000. That's important to know. If I look at the same thing in Florida, if a property is uh, assessed at $10,000, it's probably worth $12,000, eleven dollars or $12,000. So much more closer to reality. And it's, uh, so when you know that, you can use that not necessarily to make offers because, again, the counties are usually two years behind. So if you have two years of flat markets, the counties are probably pretty accurate. But if you have like a run-up like we had it in 2001, 2002, or 2020, 2021, and, and the land continues, then chances are the county's assessed value currently is too low. 
And when we have a, a, a price decline like we had in 2009, then chances are the county's assessed value is too high for a couple of years until it levels out again. So you can't really run by it, and you also cannot use assessed values in California. Because California has Proposition 13, and so Proposition 13 basically says that when you, when you buy a property, your, your assessed value gets reassessed to whatever the purchase price is or close to it, and then it stays there forever unless you sell, until you sell it again, and the most it can go up, I think, is 2%. So if you have a big run-up where prices double, triple, in over a certain, over 10 years or so, your assessed values are completely out of whack. And now imagine somebody owns a piece of land in the Hollywood Hills that they have held in a family trust or so for 80 years. Assessed value is gonna be like $8,000. Real market value, 25 million or so, <laughs> right? So that's possible. So if you go by assessed value in California, you might select some records and then you get people calling you and say like, I want $17 million for my land. Because it's probably worth it, but it's because you, can't, you just can't use assessed value. But outside of California, you can. But I wouldn't use it as a, as a what we call as the rule of thumb. The rule of thumb that basically like, you know approximately like, if assessed value is, is in, is in uh, and, and where is it in, in, in here in uh, Nevada? Do you guys know by chance? It escapes me right now, but I think it's closer to market value too here. So some of them are 50%, some of them are 80, 90%, some of them are, are, are two thirds, some of them, and they're all over the place. So when you go into a new state, what you simply do is you call the county one time and say like, hey, I got like five properties here that, uh, that, are, that I'm interested in buying and they have these assessed values. Can you tell me what the relationship the assessed value is to the actual market value? And they usually tell you. You can also figure it out by just simply looking at the comps. You see like, okay, some properties that have sold and then look, go to the counties, like, well, they've sold for 50K and they're assessed at 30. Oh, that looks like it's two-fifth. Or they're assessed at 40, looks like it's 80%. And you do another one, it looks like it's the same kind of ratio. After you see that again and again, it tells you what their typical ratio is. We love sliding scales, as you guys can tell. It's because it, it all depends, like, here's the thing. If somebody, if somebody has a $10,000 property, can you afford to offer him $4,500 for that deal? No, because what are you going to sell it for? $6,000. If you buy it for $4,500 plus closing costs, do you even make any money? No, there's no money left for you to be made. So therefore, you can't do that. But So therefore, a $10,000 property, you have to get at $0.10 cents or $0.15 cents on the dollar. Because if you get it at $1,500, and you sell it at $6,000, even after closing costs, you're still making at least three, dollars $4,000 on the deal. Now, a $100,000 property, can you offer $40,000 or $50,000 on that deal and sell it for $65,000? Yes, of course. Now, a million-dollar property, can you offer $600,000 on that property or $700,000 on that property and sell it for seven eighty dollars again, which is still a good deal? Yes. So you start seeing like the higher the property value, the higher the percentage you want to offer on these deals. Now what happens at the same time, it doesn't mean you automatically offer the high dollar amounts or the high percentages because what happens when you make low dollar amounts? Here's Nancy Swar, one of our former master coaches. She actually retired from that, but she's still available for some students to do like specialty calls because she's transitioned actually into developing land. And she says like, just want to post another example of how well Jack and Michelle's system works. Or she met, she, anyway, she received this call this morning from somebody. So the seller wanted $68,000 and the market value was $105,000. So they looked at it. They said, I want 68K. Is that an unreasonable amount of money when the property is worth 100, 105? It's not unreasonable, but it didn't make sense to Nancy because she wanted to do a certain deal with it. So she offered $21,930 on the deal. They countered with 25. Right? So again, the thing is, just because they offer six, they want 68, it doesn't, it doesn't change anything in your calculations. You offer what you think you need to offer. And then if it doesn't get accepted, well, then you can work your way into it with, with, uh, with, with follow-up strategies, which we'll talk about much more tomorrow. And thing. Now, I love this one. This one is my favorite of all times. This one says, 
Uh, let me read it here. This one says, I can't even read it. It says like, somebody says on the bottom, it says, we're not interested in selling at this amount. She offered $60. If you would be willing to consider a minimum of $100, we will sign the papers. <laughs> Otherwise, not worth our time. <laughs> right? So there we go. Some people, 40 bucks is the world. Right? So it's, it's all good. Right? So again, it's, 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 it's funny, but it's, it's true. So don't be afraid of offering low dollar amounts. Some people will accept it. Now, if they would have said, if they would have come back, like, this is ridiculous, I want a thousand, I don't know what this property is worth, but actually she did tell us that she actually sold it. If I'm not mistaken, she sold it for $17,000. But so, so if they would have come back, it's like, $60, are you freaking kidding me? I want two grand for it. Would that have still been a deal? Oh yeah. So don't be afraid of making low offers because sometimes you get deals like that.